superheroes. Fearless and incredible people who manage to overcome the impossible. They are the names that we've known since our youngest days. They are the reason we put blankets on our backs pretending we can do almost anything. We read about them and watch them on screens from computers to IMAX. But how far can the imagination take us keeping the true nature of these incredible figures pure? More importantly, how can we manage to keep them relevant for another generation to enjoy? World War II was a time of fear, and it was the names of Siegel, Kane, and even Lee that began to bring these creations to life. These figures would fill the newsstands and general stores, and young children would flock to find out what happened to their favorite heroes. When the war started to escalate in the early 1940s, there would be two big names in the DC comic universe to grace the screen. But it would be the greatest of them all that would be revealed to the world through another wonder, animation. It's a plane! It's Superman! Famed cartoonist Max Fleischer, who was well known for his work such as Betty Boop and Popeye, was the first to bring Superman to the masses in his very own cartoon show. It was the classic wonderment of good versus evil, and of course the heroes was always winning. In fact, this truly created the modern Superman mythology, such as the Superman ability to fly, and the famous quote, look up in the sky. By the end of the war, with peace finally settling across the world, a new decade would soon bring this modern marvel to every household. It would allow the family to gather around, much like the old days of radio. Television would allow the superheroes to return via the famous faces of George Reeves and Adam West. But eventually, as revolutionary as this time was for media and pop culture, it would take a huge toll on the true fans' emotions towards the superhero image. The Silver Age of Comics began when the Golden Age of Television was in full force. The 1950s brought hardships on the world of comics and superheroes. Parents felt that the nature of the comics were inappropriate for America's youth, while the Silver Age ushered in a whole new generation of writers and the reinvention of famous heroes. There was still much work to do in this world. The 1950s and 60s were when the world was looking to the stars and the great space race began. The shift of interests went from heroes fighting Nazis to aliens and using lasers instead of guns. Also, due to the current television programming featuring superheroes, the concept of being family-friendly would soon bring animation back into the picture. The 1960s brought Superman and Batman back into the animation world, but also expanded the gallery of superheroes as well. Filmation was the first to bring shows like The New Adventures of Superman to children of all ages on Saturday mornings. This show, once again like the Fleischer cartoons, was Superman foiling the forces of evil. Other heroes such as Superboy, Aquaman, and the Justice League would follow as well as bring children to an hour of superhero excitement on their television set. The shows were good-natured and teaching kids good values in life. Of course we all know that as a concept of camp. Most of these heroes also featured the use of sidekicks, having young developing heroes by the main hero's side but it would be more relatable to young children by taking the values learned from these kinds of shows into the real world. It would teach them responsibility and how to help others. The shows were successful, and by the time the 1970s rolled around, children's programming was overly abundant. The span stretched from early childhood development to more action cartoons. Names such as Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny were reaching their golden years, and even the world of film, thanks to the Disney Company, had paved the way for animation to be most prominent. Yet when it came back to the look at the superheroes, particularly the DC animated programming, one animation studio would grab it and take it for a ride they would never forget. From the 1960s to the 1980s, two men had control of animation on the small screen. William Hanna and Joseph Barbera were pioneers in their field by bringing the concept of animation to primetime television. At the same time, they created a slew of kids' shows, mostly involving a team of teenagers solving mysteries. In 1973, the studio got a hold of the DC Animation franchise, and the Super Friends were born. To be suitable for children, unlike their comic book counterparts, they were very limited in violence, as most shows usually were. To make them even more child-friendly, they would even make appearances in other Hanna-Barbera programs. Examples are such as Batman and Robin solving mysteries with the Scooby-Doo gang, and Wonder Woman helping out the Brady kids. In addition, new heroes were created for child relatability. The Junior Super Friends, Wendy, Marvin, and Wonder Dog were the first of many. They were also the characters that were true to the main attraction of the shows. The superheroes themselves were mostly secondary. In 1977, the all-new Super Friends Hour finally gave young viewers a taste of the rogues gallery of villains, yet toned down, and the antics of the Wonder Twins and their monkey Gleek were not really helping much. 
In 1978, the challenge of the Super Friends began the elimination of the young Goofy heroes and finally pitting them against their supervillain counterparts. The Legion of Doom was a team of 13 supervillains banding together to take on the Super Friends. With the violence still being toned down for child-friendly purposes, programming finally got Good vs. Evil returned to television. Sadly, this would be as far as it would go. The show kept reinventing itself, changing rosters little by little to make the show more action-packed. By the 1980s, the Super Friends were changed to the Super Powers show. It was done so so they could compete with other new shows such as He-Man, Transformers, and Thundercats. At the same time, Filmation and Ruby Spears had their own Superman and Batman animated adventures. Similar to Hanna-Barbera in every way, but it featured more of Batman's and Superman's rogues gallery of villains. Another hero that emerged was the comedic Plastic Man. By 1986, however, Hanna-Barbera's era had ended. By the time the superheroes seemed to have been milked for everything that it was worth, and the interest in superheroes had returned to the big screen and back to the pages of comic books. 1978 had seen Superman make his film debut, and it's one of the highest grossing films at the time. During the Super Friends era, a whole new type of film had been created, the Blockbuster, a highly budgeted film created to fill as many seats as possible. Still, even that franchise didn't last forever as Superman created three sequels and some called the final two films the worst movies ever made. The gold was found in the original source. The 1980s saw a return to the shadows in the world of comics. Writers such as Frank Miller and Alan Moore showed the world that the boundaries needed to be pushed to tell a great story. At this time, there were many different heroes from many different companies. Each of them gave a world of comics some of the greatest stories in history. The comics featured gore, extreme violence, and foul language. At this time, writers were getting praise, not being scorned. It was time for another famous hero to make his own return, and this time it would be on the big screen. 1989 saw Tim Burton create his own rendition of Batman. Batman had not been seen in live action since 1966, thanks to Adam West. Batman at this time was taken right out of the comics, donning a black costume and being feared by the forces of evil. This film also featured Batman's greatest nemesis as a true psychopath who enjoyed killing people rather than squirting them with water from plastic flowers. This film was box office gold, and fans on a global scale were thrilled to see a true comic book persona rise out of the pages and onto the big screen. While the heroes to a degree made a huge return, the world of animation was struggling. Disney's animation department had almost headed into bankruptcy, and even animation had taken a darker tone. Animation had now gone into an era of cult classics such as Fritz the Cat and Heavy Metal. The world of cartoons was going through a battle of the sexes while boys and girls had their own programs to watch. The 1980s would give us a world where kids were feeling serious angst, and it would be seen through the birth of alternative and grunge music and, of course, MTV. Cable had also introduced children to the zaniness of Nicktoons, and they returned to prime time with The Simpsons. By this time, there was only one man who realized that in all this mess, this would be the perfect time to reintroduce superheroes to animation and television. This time, it would be done right. In 1991, a man by the name of Bruce Timm was given the opportunity of a lifetime. Being a true fan of comic books, he felt it was time to bring a new kind of animated program to television. While this would be featured as a kid's show, it would be so much more. With Tim Burton's Batman film being the greatest thing since sliced bread, it was only appropriate that Batman would be a character featured in this new series. With a brilliant team of writers led by Paul Dini and Alan Burnett, on September 5th, 1992, Warner Brothers launched the pilot of Batman the Animated Series. This show was a real punch in the face for its viewers because it was a different kind of show than anything else of the time. It was a show that brought true comic book Batman to the screen. This show was dark and gothic and even somewhat old-fashioned, featuring a 1940 feeling but with modern technology. It was also a very visual show. While you knew that Batman was the hero, he was a figure that always stayed in the shadows and didn't say much. His words that were spoken were through his actions. It was a show that moved through motion and music. The show didn't even have an opening credits with a title in it. You just knew that it was a Batman show. The show went back to the true nature of who Batman was. 
showing the beginnings of his character through the death of his parents, and showing him take on no prisoners when taking challenges. The show itself was only a 30-minute episode each, yet each one had its own epic story that felt like a movie. It was also the first time that not only the main character was developed, but the whole world around him was developed as well. Everyone from Batman's allies to his villains were giving their own story, and it was those elements that made Batman the Animated Series an instant classic. Still, for a show like this one to be successful, it takes more than a great story. In order to make a show like Batman the Animated Series a landmark, you had to give it a look and a sound unlike any other. This show made history by assembling some of the most prestigious actors and actresses, not voice actors. Led by voice director Andrea Romano, names like Richard Mall, Roddy McDowell, and Ron Perlman were only a few people who lent their vocals to this program. Of course, the hardest voice would be to find the Dark Knight himself, and one day, he arrived in the actor named Kevin Conroy. Conroy was able to bring his voice deep into a dark place to bring out Batman's true nature, but also give him more of a persona than just a hero. He made Batman himself, not Bruce Wayne, but Batman a man, showing that he could let his emotions get the best of him and at the same time wear his heart on his sleeve. He would also bounce his character off of people in his life. He would have Batman talk in a distinctive, different tone to a character like James Gordon than to his butler Alfred. It would not only be Batman and his supporting cast showing true signs of death. The staff, being true fans of the lore, would go into areas of other media to bring historic pieces of Batman's world to the show. One of the show's greatest tributes was giving a role to Adam West in the episode titled Beware the Grey Ghost. Of course, the other area where voices would be crucial would be Batman's rogues gallery. Probably the most well-known and most beloved in the superhero world, his villains are appreciated just as much as Batman. These would be villains that would put human life in danger and show no mercy towards anybody. Some would even walk the gray line and not always be the basic black and white villain. After all, even the most cold-blooded of killers doesn't always start out evil. Then again, there is one villain in Batman's rogues gallery who would beg to differ. When it comes to an arch nemesis, the character is usually, in any shape or form, the exact opposite of the hero. The Joker is the perfect example for Batman. The Joker had been personified by many up until the release of the animated series, but this Joker would be unlike any other. He would be the villain that would be so truly evil that it would make the viewers smile at how deliciously evil he was. To voice him would be the most unlikely of actors, Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill was finally given a chance to break away from being typecasted as everyone's favorite Jedi Knight, Luke Skywalker. Hamill gave the Joker a personality unlike anything before, a real crazy psychotic, but being a children's program, the ability to make him fun and have the audience enjoy his villainy. He provided some of the best episodes that the show offered during its run, and at the same time introduced a brand new character into the Batman lore. Providing the voice by the talented Arlene Sorkin, the Joker was given a sidekick, a devious damsel named Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn was ever so popular that she was the first character on a comic book based television show to be written into the comic book universe for DC. To this day she is a fan favorite in the world of Batman with legions of fans. With the Joker and the rest of Batman's rogues gallery showing up throughout the seasons, Batman was never short handed with his own help. Being the show as dark as Batman was, the fans were wondering how the rest of Batman's allies would be written into the show. Robin and Batgirl, of course, were two of the main focuses because of their historic nature in Batman's world. Having these characters show may in fact cause the show to be a little bit more child-friendly and go back to the days of Adam West and the Super Friends. In fact, Bruce Timm and his writers always felt a connection with Robin being that he was the human side of Batman and the element that always prevented him from going over the edge. The show featured a older, more mature Robin, placing them in situations that would be just as challenging for Batman. Making him a real integral part of the show, they brought him in gradually, by not always having him in every episode or being told that he couldn't come on certain missions. Moments like those were more connecting to a younger audience, but also showed a fatherly quality in Batman. Yet, in some episodes, Robin did show in situations that he was needed for Batman. 
Robin's Reckoning was also a real tribute to the boy Wonder by giving him a fantastic origin story. It was an episode that showed the roles of mentor and student completely reversed when Batman had to save Robin from going over the edge, and realizing that Robin had become a hero on his own. Eventually, the series would incorporate Robin more, and eventually change its name in 1992 to The Adventures of Batman and Robin, with a new title screen and a theme composed by Shirley Walker. Batgirl would also emerge. Instead of having her just show up as a part of the team, she was also given her own origin story. Fans got to see this character get roped into the world of crime fighting in the episode Heart of Steel. Not accepted at first by the dynamic duo, by the end of the show's third season, Batgirl was just as important as Batman himself. By 1993, Batman the Animated Series was one of the most critically acclaimed shows on television, and one of the most well-received in history among viewers. The show was not only appreciated by children, but the fans of the comics dating back to the Silver Age brought this animated persona of Batman into their lives with open minds and arms. The show won multiple Annie and even Emmy awards, and even being given a chance to have a few episodes in primetime viewing. The series was reaching its end, but there was still one last hurdle to jump. It was time to take the magic of Batman's world and bring it to the big screen. On December 14th, 1993, Batman Mask of the Phantasm debuted in theaters. The story was about a new vigilante killing off mob bosses, but at the same time, a face from Bruce Wayne's past would show up in Gotham City. This was a film that tackled two topics never shown in the show, Batman's love and his own origin story. The film featured the same writers and voice cast and a powerful soundtrack by the show's composer Shirley Walker. Unfortunately, the movie did not get the reaction most would have hoped for. Fingers were mostly pointed at Warner Brothers for poor marketing of the film and made up for the budget with an extremely successful home video release. The film is still on many top lists of various critics and in 2010 it was number 25 on the list of greatest animated films of all time. While this would not be the last time a film would be released by Bruce Timm and his staff, it would however be the last time this style of animation would see the big screen. On September 15, 1995, it was time to announce Batman the Animated Series would show its final episode, Batgirl Returns. While many were unsure what would happen now that this historic show had gone off the air, there were always rumors and hope that the Dark Knight would return. Batman was one of the biggest household names now, with the success of this series and a third Batman film hitting theaters earlier that year. Yet, this was not the end for these brave men who had broken the boundaries of what was known as animation and children's programming. Batman the Animated Series was still in syndication, and of course, on the same channel it was launched on, it had some competition from the Marvel Universe. Saban and Fox Kids had just began its final season of X-Men the Animated Series, and it was heading into its second season of Spider-Man the Animated Series. Also. Warner Brothers, in that very same year, took the helm of the network station WPIX and featured an entire cavalcade of new Warner Brothers animated shows. Naturally, Bruce Timm was tapped once again, being asked for another show. While Batman being a tremendous success it was, the next place to go was an obvious one. <laughs> 